I don't know when the first moment was for you, but I do remember it vividly for me. Uh, it was during March break of 2020, right in the first days of the pandemic. My family was vacationing in Mexico and we were glued to the television watching one of Justin Trudeau's early addresses. And I don't know how many of you remember this, but I'll never forget it. When he kind of stared into the camera and said this, check this out. Canadian travelers should return to Canada via commercial means while it is still possible to do so. Let me be clear. If you're abroad, it's time for you to come home. Do you remember that? It's time to come home. It's time to come home. I'll never forget that. And especially, I'll never forget how moments after hearing that, uh, Becky and my phones started to light up with people who were insisting that we immediately leave the country out of obedience to our prime minister. What was interesting, though, was that at around the same time, probably right as, as instantaneous, we were receiving other messages. Messages like we should actually stay in a place like Mexico that's warm and, and sunnier and, and outdoors where we're probably gonna be safer. Or if we were traveling back, we shouldn't travel through the United States because things were already blowing up in the US. And it turns out back in March, 2020, we incorporated a, a, a lot of all of that. And we did come home from Mexico a little bit earlier and we rerouted some flights so that we weren't flying home through the, the US. That's not my point. My point is that that was the very first moment for me where I felt the divide. That was the first moment for me where I felt the pandemic divide. When I look back, it's kind of laughable that we even debated or divided over things like that, given where our society is at today. But it feels like from those early days, those early moments, things kind of just mushroomed and, and, and snowballed from there. You know, what was early division around the reality of the pandemic, whether COVID is even real or whether it's just another flu, Sir, kind of soon escalated to how to navigate the pandemic and whether lockdowns of a society were appropriate, especially when you considered that we were early on and since then, we've been navigating three crises in one, the physical health crisis of COVID, the mental health crisis associated with it, and the economic crisis to boot. And so there's all kinds of division and polarization around lockdowns and how to navigate the pandemic. You fast forward into about a year later and all of a sudden vaccines emerged where there was a new level of division and polarization, some treating them urgently, some treating them hesitantly. And then fast forward to the recent months when you know, we discovered a, a breakthrough variant right around the time that uh, we were encouraging boosters. And so we were kind of locked down again for a, seemed like I think a fifth wave and began then to reopen with more division and polarization right around the institution of the vaccine passport. And now we find ourselves, you know, with the mask mandates rescinding, you know, on different sides of the divide again. And one thing after another has just separated and divided and caused polarization in and among us. And I'd like to think that in a community like ours, our biblical framework of what we re referred to over the years as love beyond belief, a framework that values and commits to the primacy of Jesus' law of love above all of the other non-salvation convictions that we might have as strongly as we might hold them, I'd like to believe that that framework would help us to experience a greater degree of unity amidst that diversity. But if I'm honest, I think that we've experienced, even in our community, we've experienced similar events and experiences of division and polarization as everyone else in society. And so today, in this third uh, week, in this aftermath series, we want to stare at our relational condition and at the relational toll that the pandemic's taken and ask a few key questions like, what the heck just happened? How did we get into this mess? And maybe most importantly, what's it going to take for us to get out of this aspect of the challenge of the pandemic and actually experience healing of our division? And as I've reflected on this, I, I feel like 
One of the real contributors to the relational pain that so many of us are experiencing in this uh, kind of aftermath of the pandemic has to do with the closeness of the relationships that have been affected. You know, this hasn't been the ordinary kind of Christmas dinner where with loved ones, you're actually able to kind of stick handle around contentious issues like politics and division. There's something about the pandemic and maybe the implications of the pandemic that have sort of forced our hand and, and outed our convictions in ways that have revealed division that maybe we didn't even know. And we found ourselves kind of offside in new ways or maybe for the first time with friends and family members and people close to us that we never even realized we were offside on these kinds of issues. And if that's one of the things that you're feeling, that the pain of the pandemic is the loss of certain close relationships or the unity in those close relationships because of pandemic conviction divides. Uh, I wonder if you can share in the heart cry of King David as he pleaded to God in Psalm 55. Here's what he said there in verse 12. He said, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. As David is pouring his heart out to God over a conflict that he's experiencing, what's breaking his heart is not just the conflict, it's the closeness of relationship with whom he's experiencing the conflict. This is someone who's been a good friend, a trusted teammate, someone with whom he's experienced deep spiritual community and the activity of God. David is grieving the loss of his spiritual family. And I wonder for some of us who are experiencing that kind of grief or experiencing that kind of loss or pain today because we found ourselves through these two years on the other side of pandemic convictions with people that are close to us. You need to appreciate that you're not alone, that not only does David understand, but Jesus does too. Remember, the Jesus that we're aspiring to follow is a Jesus who was betrayed by some of his best friends when it mattered most. And when the chips were down, some of his very closest friends denied even knowing him. And so if you're in a place today of aloneness and heartbreak because of some of the division and polarization that the pandemic has caused, I would hope that you can cry out to God in the same way that David does in Psalm 55. Look what he says in verse 22. He says there, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. This can be one of those moments, as divided as we are, as alone as we might be, and as heartbroken as we may find ourselves because of the loss of certain relationships. This may be a moment where we can find the reality that Jesus is all we need because Jesus is all we've got. On top of the closeness of relationships causing so much pain during the pandemic, the other thing that I think has contributed to the pain of these conflicts is our capacity to navigate them, or maybe more accurately, our lack of capacity to navigate them. In some sense, I wonder whether this particular morning uh, in this aftermath series should have actually been saved for the very end because it's kind of only as you can fully appreciate the impact on each of us personally of the trauma of the last two years, you know, of the, the grief that we all carry and of the weariness and exhaustion because of the uncertain and undetermined finish line of it all that we're going to stare at next week. It's only when you kind of accrue one after the other on top of each other that you can appreciate the, the, the pain and the capacity that we all have to actually engage in the restoration of these kinds of relationships. It makes me think of couples that 
find themselves in a marriage counseling session when things are really difficult in their in their relationship. And you know, part of the problem is that things are difficult in the relationship. But the bigger problem is the chasm between the capacity that it's going to take to get out of that conflict and the capacity that they find themselves in because of the pain of the conflict that they're in. You know, to get out of their merit, marital difficulties or their relational difficulties requires them to be at their best when because of the pain and the conflict, they find themselves at their worst. And that discrepancy between the high capacity needed to get out of it and the weakened lower capacity that you find yourselves in it is a gap that makes it difficult to navigate. Reminds me of when I uh, used to be trained as a lifeguard back in, in my early 20s. And uh, I've shared this before. One of the things that lifeguards learn, in addition to rescue techniques and first aid and CPR and things like that, uh, is a skill set called defenses and releases. You learn defenses and releases. And the reason you learn those skills is because when you go to rescue a drowning person, believe it or not, their first instinct is not to thank you. They don't express gratitude and appreciation, at least not in the moment, when they're being rescued, and they actually don't offer a lot of help. Because the instinct of a drowning person in the crisis of drowning is actually to grab you, even as a lifeguard, and to hold you under in order for them to stay afloat. The survival instinct of a person in crisis is to hold other people under in order to stay afloat. And I feel like with so many of us in that kind of condition, because of the trauma, because of the grief, because of the weariness, and bringing that context of where we're at personally into our relationships, it makes relating with each other that much more difficult on top of the polarization that COVID's caused. As I've thought about it, this image has come to mind that the Bible uses for what the people of faith are like in community. It comes out of 1 Corinthians 12, among other places, where it says there, Now you together are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now, you together are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We've taught this, this verse many times to refer to the fact that every follower of Jesus is a necessary part of the body of Christ and has something unique to contribute. And that's true, but why this image came to mind lately for me is when I think about us as a body, functioning as a community for the purpose of sharing the life and love of Jesus in the world— it just struck me to consider how many of the body parts of a body, even like ours, are actually in pain these days, are wounded, are sore, are hurting, and are injured. And it made me ask, what would it take to actually heal some of these injured body parts so that together as a body we could function more effectively? And I wondered whether... There's actually some truth from the natural world that we could apply to the spiritual world when it comes to our relational lives these days. Because when it comes to a physical body, the science is pretty tested and true that to heal injured body parts requires four things. It's called the RICE principle. The RICE principle, it stands for rest, ice, compression, and elevation. And in the minutes that remain, I, I just am wondering what it would be like if we applied the truth of the rice principle to ourselves as body parts in the spiritual body of Christ when it comes to our relationships with one another and other people close to us. What would it look like, for example, for us to apply some rest to those relationships, where rest is simply uh, kind of removing yourself from the relational activities that contribute to division and polarization. What would it look like if we rested from those, if we ceased from connecting and engaging in those very contentious conversations? You know, Proverbs 10 says this, when words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. A lot of words, a lot of propensity for sin, no words greater propensity for not only wisdom, but for healing. And I wonder for how many of us we could employ the step of simply resting or taking a break from those contentious relationships to help us heal. 
what would it look like to take a break, not just from getting together with people or, you know, shooting them texts or sending them messages, which sometimes is hard to do with people that you might live with or, or work with every day, but what would it look like to stop the news scrolling or the social media scrolling or dare I suggest, what would it look like even for the next two weeks between today and Easter Sunday for those of us who are body parts in this community to cease from social media activity altogether? What would it look like to not post, to not share, to not make your point, to not challenge someone else's point, to not comment, to not refute, to not advocate, to not judge, and just to take a two-week break. What could the value of rest from those conflicts and divisions provide to the spirit and soul of you and I as body parts in the body of Christ? Because rest is integral to healing wounded body parts. At the same time, so is ice. And when you think about what ice does, icing helps reduce the swelling and pain of an injured body part. It helps reduce the swelling and pain of your hurt. And the question is, spiritually or relationally, how do you reduce the pain of relational hurt? Well, counterintuitively to the rest, you can actually lean in to other relationships, to lean in to people who can play the role of advisor in your life. Look at Proverbs 15, 22. It says, plans go wrong for lack of advice, but many advisors bring success. Many advisors on the pain that we're experiencing, on what we're feeling, can help provide an objectivity and an encouragement, a prayer support, and, and a wisdom that can help us not only navigate the future, but can help mitigate the pain, especially if those advisors bring skill sets of expertise like spiritual directors or therapists that we can leverage in order to help us navigate the pain we're experiencing in a way that we otherwise couldn't on our own. The question today is, who could those advisors be for you to lean in on for healing of your relational injuries as a body part in our body? The third step is compression. Compression is all about applying direct attention to the injured area. And, you know, when it comes to applying attention to the relationship that's injured, Jesus has provided a conflict resolution process in Matthew chapter 18. Look at what it says in verse 15. He says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. That's how the sequence begins. And I want us to notice two quick things. First of all, that if you've been hurt from, by, by somebody, it's actually your responsibility to initiate the conflict resolution sequence. It's not the person's responsibility who hurt you, most probably because they most likely have no idea that they hurt you, right? You're responsible to initiate that conversation. And secondly, when you do, it's a different conversation than the one that you've been having that's been hurtful. It's what Jesus describes as pointing out the offense. In poker language, it's the difference between playing the cards of the hand to playing the player. And you enter into a new conversation, not about the division and the disagreement that caused that's caused you hurt, but about the fact that you've been hurt to try to mitigate that hurt. And in playing out that and the rest of Jesus' conflict resolution sequence, we can provide direct attention to the relational pain that we've been experiencing. And then finally, in the Rice Principle, there's elevation, elevating the injured limb, which is all about fostering blood flow to that injured area. Well, the question is, what is the blood flow of injured people relationally? Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.11, where it says, encourage each other and build each other up. Encourage each other and build each other up. Allow the love and the life flow of Jesus Christ to flow through you into other people in ways that build up instead of tear down. And the question for each of us today, even in our trauma and our grief and our weariness, and even in the relational pain of people close to us, the question is, is there a way 
that we could allow the blood to flow of Jesus' life and love in a way that could actually build up someone across the COVID divide where we find ourselves polarized at odds and hurt. Would there be a way, for example, for someone of like trucker convoy conviction to actually reach across that divide and do something that builds up someone that they know who has been significantly COVID cautious? Could they reach out and simply allow that person with whom they formerly had close relationship to let them know that they miss them and that they love them? Could they do something to build them up? Similarly, could someone insisting that we all continue to wear masks actually reach across the divide to a parent who's eager to get their children out of wearing their masks and actually express the love of Jesus in a way that builds them up? You know, send them a card, send them a note, send them flowers, make them a meal, some act of love that builds them up. Could we cross those divides in a way that allows the blood or the, the love and life of Jesus to flow again? And as ridiculous as that might feel to you in the place of relational pain and heartbreak where you find yourself to actually love someone who's hurt you, Let's appreciate today that that is precisely the nature and the essence of the person of Jesus whom we aspire to follow. Now, Jesus wants to enter into our aloneness. He wants to enter into our heartbreak. He wants to enter into the isolation and the pain of the division and polarization and wants to love us right where we're at but as we've said many times, Jesus loves us too much to leave us there and actually wants to empower us to be agents of healing, not just in ourselves, but in others as well. I was thinking about uh, this image that came to mind uh, through the minimal social media scrolling that, that I do and uh, we throw it on the screen. You can see there, it, it struck me as an image of Jesus' response to so many polarizing figures in our society, to you know, convict or cop, to frontline worker, to vaccine advocate or anti-mask protester, to soldier, to Ukrainian family, to LGBTQ person, or to young child. The same thing is true in the Jesus who relates to every one of those. And that's what we've got to kind of face today. That Jesus' response to the person who's hurt you is self-sacrificial, foot-washing love. Jesus' response, as much as he's there for you in your pain, feeling it and providing a presence and comfort and peace with you, Jesus' response to the person causing you pain is self-sacrificial, foot-washing love. And as people aspiring to follow Jesus, we need to appreciate that that's the way of life that we're invited into, even in a season like this. We've referred many times to Philippians chapter 2, where it says in verse 4 and 5, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. They must have the same attitude about COVID that you have. No, no, that's actually not what it says. It says you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus has. Not that they have the same attitude as you about polarizing and divisive issues. For many of us who are drowning in COVID and who are finding it hard to stay afloat, particularly because of the relational strife and the division and conflict that we experience, Jesus understands where you're at. And he wants to enter into your pain and brokenness and loneliness to provide a comfort and a peace that maybe you've never known. But as he does, he wants to empower you and he wants to transform you, and he wants to enable you to be an agent of comfort and peace and reconciliation to others 
appreciating that what's going to get us out of the pain and heartbreak of this pandemic is not just a bunch of self-help, but actually the following of Jesus. Self-help won't get us out of this pandemic. Jesus will, if we lean into him in a fuller and deeper way as followers of his. So let's allow Jesus to meet us where we're at and let's receive and experience his peace and his comfort and his love, even in our aloneness and our heartbreak. But let's let him empower us and transform us and enable us to be the peace-making, unity-fostering, rice principle experiencing body parts in a body that is contributing to the healing of our division. Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus, on a morning like today, uh, we look to you to be a healing agent in us. But at the same time, we, we want to look to you to be a unifying agent on your behalf. We know that when you were abandoned and denied by your closest friends, you still prayed for one thing. You prayed that your followers would be one so the world would see and understand the reality of your life and your love. And I pray in all of the prayers that we offer that we could be, as we've said many times before, that answer to the one prayer of you, the one who answers all of ours. Meet us in our relational pain. Help us to heal from our relational pain and help us to take the steps in following you to heal the relational pain of others and to be bridge builders across the immense divide we find ourselves in the aftermath of this pandemic. Make us those people, please, Jesus. We pray in your precious and powerful name. Amen.